When I initially wrote this book, I decided to share a few chapters online to a certain website called Critique Circle. It's a good platform I would recommend if you're open for reading new writings and want yours reviewed in return. But essentially, by the time readers got to this point in the story, there was one general complaint that was summarised perfectly in the titles of one of the reviews that said, What the shit is going on? Not a bad question. This book does start off rather uh, headfirst into an unexplained and uh, lost setting in a way. But I've always preferred to be thrown headfirst into something rather than had my hand held throughout. Well, the story might seem confusing and uh, certainly a bit all over the place. A lot of this will be answered in the upcoming chapters. Whether you believe that I'm competent enough to pull that off or not, well, I'm trusting that you have more faith in the work of unknown strangers than I do myself. If you've made it this far, I'd say it's worth hanging around for a few more chapters to see if you like the plot that's beginning to form or to make fun of my dubious voice acting skills. Because these next chapters introduce one of the final major POV characters, and along with him, more voices and accents that I'll have to tackle. Expect that, and more, in the next few chapters of Apocalypse Awakening, an unconventional narration. Chapter 4 Downpour Cold. So very cold. The streams continued to spread. They seeped amidst rocks and roots, between crumbling concrete and twisted tree trunks, and from smashed skyscrapers to ruined roadways. The deluge continued unabated, pattering against mangled street signs, burbling in growing puddles and dripping through tree leaves only to repeat the process amongst the sheltering shrubbery. It began last night. First crept a light mist into the city, hanging between the balance of fog and low cloud. After the reconnaissance, a spearhead of drizzle swept the area, coating any surface still clinging on to the hope of staying dry. Then the real assault began. A heavenly torrent that didn't allow a moment's rest for the earthly ruins below. The battle, now firmly in sodden hands, turned to a civil war, raging between monsoon curtains of heavy droplets and sprays of confused rainwater cast about by stray gusts. Michael watched the thriving street jungle's thick leaves and tall grass blades sway with the rain, happy to oblige in the jig of nature. Michael was not as happy. Surrendering the struggle to stay dry hours ago, he walked, bare-chested, down the middle of yet another dilapidated road. The many street blocks might have looked different from one another on a sunny, restful day. The way the once trendy glass skyscrapers have been smashed into one another, intertwining with their neighbours to create a new kind of absurd art form, intrigued Michael from his perch high amongst the buildings yesterday. Now all the structures seemed the same, lurking behind shifting sheets of icy water, adorned with cloudy grey hats. He couldn't tell if this was the fifth block he walked down, or the tenth. One thing was certain. He was lost, within a giant city of dull, straight crosses. At least the flat streets were easy routes for Michael to navigate. Shame he didn't know where he was meant to be navigating to. The next wave of rain droplets rushed towards him from further down the street, the drumming water trampling over the lighter deluge in its way. Michael held an arm over his eyes as the onslaught engulfed him. Each new rain drop trickling off him took a little of his willpower with it. His hands were prune-like, soaked through and chilled to the bone, every saturated fold of skin complaining whenever it moved, which was a lot. The rest of his body fared little better, much of it numbed completely cold and clammy. Water dripped from the hair plastered to his forehead, having grown noticeably longer while he slept. The lashing waterlogged the jacket wrapped around his waist, weighing him down like a training belt. He barely saw ahead when he felt brave enough to look up, always casting his battered eyes from the stinging drizzle. 
No one could enjoy such a miserable barrage. Michael's foot stung as he crunched on a twig of brambles. He swore and tensed, waiting for the rush of pain to ripple through his body and press on his soul. He waited. Water dripped off his nose, feeding the valley of rivers flowing over his pecs as he stared at the splattering puddles at his feet. Nothing. He plucked the thorn from his wrinkled foot, a step closer to learning how much damage his body took before the mending process began. It had happened this morning, when walking through the skyscrapers to avoid the rain, the ground floors carpeted with glittering shards of glass. Twice, Michael accidentally stepped on a piece, and twice he doubled over in pain as all his energy concentrated on the single point in his foot. Every time he drew blood, the strange force would come with it, and the last time he'd confirmed it. He did emit some kind of hot vapour with the healing, steam spewing out of the open gash and surrounding pores. He didn't know why, and with no control over the power, he'd opted to walk directly down the street where there was less debris, sacrificing all elements of stealth. It didn't seem to matter in this place. Michael clambered over a felled lamppost and landed in a mud-filled hole blown into the road. Once again, he cursed his lack of shoes, pulled out his feet one at a time in a great squelch. The rain drowned all over sound, washing Michael in a drape of sonorous pitter-pattering. Nothing had happened in the last few hours of wandering along the valley of abandoned monoliths, giving plenty of time to ponder this ghost of a world. Somehow, there was too little and too much to think about. He focused first on survival. He might be barely clothed, but Michael doubted he would catch any illness because of the cold. If his body could heal any injury in an instant, then surely sickness would pose no threat. Hopefully. He was more concerned about the lack of food. He felt weaker each time the healing surges rippled through his body, and his stomach started to clench and rumble, its growl drowned out by the rain. Last evening, after waking from the tank, Michael spent nearly an hour chasing dinner through the building's basement car park like a madman. At first he was patient, listening for the telltale squeaking and scrabbling amongst the crippled pillars and rusted car husks. He had leapt at the rats when in sight, but they slipped away every time, scurrying with tiny claws in a speed he couldn't match. Eventually, Michael lost his temper and started flinging loose pieces of rubble at the little shits. They were small, fast, and he had left humiliated. Rats were another item on his growing list of dislikes with this city. Rats weren't the only animal around. Barks and howls ran amok in the distance. Dogs. He was less scared about being attacked by feral mongrels, and more fearful of his own reaction if he did see some. Detestable to think. He might have to kill and eat a dog. They were strays left behind after the chaos. Or, if they had owners, they'd yet to introduce themselves. Michael was certain he'd find someone eventually, all the buildings and cars he'd come across had been pilfered, including one market shop devoid of everything except a set of plastic-sealed birthday cards. Someone must have survived the devastation to root around for supplies, but where were they? And more importantly, were they friendly? Perhaps the main perpetrators had long left the city after their attack, leaving behind the survivors to gather the pieces. Or maybe they were still here. He didn't fancy fighting a group capable of wiping out an entire city's population. But, if extermination was what they were after, why not use weapons of mass destruction? These gashed buildings and broken streets had been hit hard, but not obliterated, not nuked. Weapons as large as cruisers had been involved, but why in the city and not above it? And if he was thinking along the line of cruiser battles, then the Alliance had probably been on one side. Who had faced them? The rebels were nowhere close to building something as complex as a cruiser. So who'd attacked this city? Who killed Finn? Michael had found something on his brother's body that confirmed it was murder. He started walking faster as he fought back to it. When he found who was responsible, he'd hunt them down and rip them apart. No weapons, no tricks. He'd use his bare hands to strangle the very... Michael knocked his shin against a bollard and stopped letting the pain in his leg throb alongside his angry thoughts. He couldn't think about Finn. Not now. It was too distracting, and speculating wouldn't help. 
more possibilities and less answers. Although, what was he distracting himself from? On missions, saddled with responsibilities, he had a clear goal to focus on. Now, somehow, there was too little and too much to think about. A chasm pulled Michael from his musings. It ran the length of the street, blocking his way, and contained an uninviting pool of re-endappled sludge, flanked at either side by a large sewer pipe rent in two. He looked for another route. A dark red shape to the right of the road caught Michael's eye, glinting from under a mass of vines. He struggled through the long, whistling grass, expecting another car to be hidden underneath. There's something ominous about one abandoned car in a street, with dented doors and smashed windows, but it's all relative. A whole city of them was overkill. It would probably contain nothing useful, a few more unclothed corpses to grimace at, but no harm in trying. He gripped a dribbling vine and ripped it away, tearing off a clump of its soggy brethren with it. He dropped the vines, took a step back and fell into the patch of grass. He shrank away from the glaring eye. Fen loved the rain. It reminded him of home, of the valley he grew up in, filled with its fair share of wet seasons and jungle. Not too different from the street they walk down now. Take away the skyscrapers, tarmac, wrecked buses, dilapidated signs, wonky lampposts, eroded statues, constant grey skies, dreary atmosphere, and a few of the rotting bodies? And it would be just like home. Fen slung his oversized hood further over himself, water dripping from the tip onto the blaster rifle hanging by the chafing strap on his neck. He wrestled with the soggy coat sleeves, eclipsing his hands, and swung the rifle onto his back, trying to redistribute the weight from his straining shoulder. Lugging around this hulk of metal wasn't a great love of his. Or roadblocks. They'd left the car four streets back when the amount of crap clogging the road became too great. Oi, Fen, quit trailing back there. You're making me bloody nervous. Coffee. The thin man with dark skin peered out from under his own hood, veil of rain cascading off the front. Fen hadn't talked with the man outside of late, drunken nights at the tavern. Usually, Fen only did patrols with other members of his clan, like everyone else. It had been that way for years, but this was an exceptional case. A special mission, Head Chief Arminius, insisted be a joint clan effort. Now Coffee, representing the Steelbreaker clan, trudged ahead, making sure to stay at the front of the pack. The man sure was acting suspicious, with those shifting eyes, although he could be a good laugh, provided you got him drunk enough in the tavern. Fen certainly wished he was there now, sat by one of the fires, feet warm and dry, larger crisp and cold. Unfortunately, they weren't in the tavern, and drinking was not allowed on patrol, not since that idiot from Fen's own clan, blind drunk, and with only a blaster rifle and shit aim to hand, had shot at an unknown gunship five days ago. Now that man and his entire party were dead, and the drones hadn't even got a good picture of the culprits. Bloody technology, Fen thought. You can always count on it to fail at just the right moment. Ever since, the tipsy buzz of walking through the abandoned city had been stolen away, replaced with nothing to block the harsh reality of the depressing, rain-swept landscape. A few hours spent venturing into this shell of a city, completely sober, felt like a long time indeed. A steelbreaker nervous? Fen teased, lusting for a little conversation to distract from the drudgery. I thought you guys feared no being without armour. He was mocking the Steelbreaker motto, which people took about as seriously as all the other clans. The Hollow Cloaks had started spouting some nonsense strapline about being there but not seen, and so, not to be outdone, every other freelancer clan clambered onto the idea. Oh no, I fear people who know how to fight. Like any sensible man, Coffee said, his voice carrying a sly smile with it. So, no worries where you're concerned. Nice one, Fen replied, but Coffee had begun walking away, unable to hear him over the pounding rain. He cupped his hands and strode after him. Are all hollow cloaks so quick-witted on patrol? An essential fighting quality and shit, Fen shouted as he caught his foot on a mischievous route. He tripped and slid on the wet tarmac, 
arm scraping, rifle clanging, face landing in a perfectly placed pothole of mud. So much for not embarrassing myself in front of the other clans. He grumbled and picked himself up to the sound of coffee chuckling. Even the man's laughter was strange, all bellow and echo, like the laugh of a child enjoying genuine amusement instead of an adult mocking scorn. Are all the best crewers so nimble on their feet? Fenn grinned, gloop sliding from the ends of his moustache and pointed goatee. One of the best crewers, he shouted back. Are you joking? If I was one of the best, I'd be in my cosy warm office right now, as far away from the action as possible. That's enough, both of you. Gods, here comes Killjoy. Bram. The tall, horse-faced man was so dull you couldn't cut butter with him. Fen would be better looking to the corpses littered around his feet for a lively comment. If you pair keep, we'll get in no time. Bram was apparently talking, his voice whipped away by the windy downpour. Fen raised a hand to his ear. What? Bram shook his head and gestured for the pair to join him. Fen frowned. Bram seemed to be under the illusion he was in charge here, just because he was part of the Hollow Cloaks. They thought they were the top dogs, ever since becoming the biggest freelancer clan last year. Far too cocky an outlook, considering the combined might of the other clans. Fen joined Coffee and Bram under the flimsy bus stand, its thin strip of plastic canopy a meagre shelter. Stop shouting, both of you, Bram said, sour little pout on his lips. What if we get spotted? Spotted? Coffee raised his arms to either side. Who by? There's just as many people wandering around here as usual. None whatsoever. Let's take a rest and cook some lunch, Fen said, nodding to Bram's backpack strapped underneath his raincoat to give him a hunchback look. Put the barbecue to good use. Grill some tasty meat. Eh? Eh? No, Bram said, curt as a damn. We have reports of that gunship being spotted twice in the last few days. Reports from overexcited youngsters with no evidence. We carry on until I say so. Now hold on a moment, Bram, Fenn said, crossing his arms and leaning back against the plastic bus stand. We agreed to a joint expedition between the clans. No one assigned you as leader. Coffee nodded. Bram stared at Fenn, too close to give her eyes narrowed. Besides... Fenn said, breaking out a smile, despite the dank tension and weather to match. We're dealing with a gunship here. What a suicidal maniac would fly in this weather? A committed one. Oh, that was quick. Had he been saving that line? Perhaps. But risk a gunship today when tomorrow's weather awaits with clear skies? Fenn shook his head. Trust me, they'll wait. Bram glanced at the grey roof of clouds. He pulled out an antique brass tube from his pocket and extended it, pressing it to his eye. The ludicrous telescope was barely longer than two lengths of Bram's hand and completely useless in this weather. Anyone could see the storm wasn't stopping for hours. Come on, Bram, Fenn said, interrupting the fruitless sightseeing session. Let's stop for lunch, at least until it dries a little. There's a spot over there. Fenn pointed to a reception lobby, sliding doors bashed open left of a chasm running the width of a street that contained an unappealing pool of rain-spattered muck and a wrecked sewer pipe.